Welcome to Liddypod, Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. So, I was sat at home one day and I got this email from a friend of mine in America and he said, I don't hear enough from you. Now, honestly, people actually want me to talk more than I actually do. And he said, why aren't you doing a podcast? And I thought, hmm, that sounds a good idea. So ever since my book, Liddy Pool, Birthplace of the Beatles, came out all those years ago, I kept thinking this would be a good thing to do. So I thought, I know the perfect person to do this with. Uh, but he wasn't available. Um, so I went down my list of friends. Uh, none of them were available. And then Paul Beasley said to me, oh, Dave, Dave, please. I said, OK, go on then. So <laughs> <laughs> I jest, I jest. Paul's a good mate of mine and... Uh, the fool said, yeah, let's do this together. Let's have a bit of fun. So uh, introducing Mr. Paul Beasley. Well, hello, Dave. Yeah, it was uh, it was a long time ago we started talking about this now, wasn't it? It, it was. And uh, we've had many breakfasts since. That's just an excuse for a breakfast. It was a perfect, yeah, perfect excuse. We, we got we had about six breakfasts and we didn't do anything, did we? <laughs> yeah. But uh, we eventually got down to making some notes and we thought, yeah, th- we'll give this a try. Why not? We'll give this a try. We'll give this a try of a, of a podcast about the Beatles, a bit of banter. Um, from the birthplace of the Beatles. Which, of course, is? Liverpool. That's it. That's I'm, gl- I'm glad you reminded me. That's the one. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, j- just tell us, first of all, Dave, w- w- where did the idea come from? Um, and, you know, what do you want to try and achieve with the podcast? There's some really good podcasts out there on the Beatles, but I thought we're not covering the Liverpool part of the story. And, of course, that, with my books and research, etc., has always been my passion, is getting across how important Liverpool was to the story of the Beatles. So I thought, we still got a lot of great people in this city. There's a lot of fantastic stories to tell as well. So I thought, why not? No, the two of us, have a good chat. This is almost like you and I meeting up for breakfast and we chat at just... A couple of other people will be listening in to what well, we're rambling if, about. If anybody listens, my mum might listen, you know. We, we, we might, my wife definitely won't, but my mum might listen. And uh, whoever wants to listen can, can listen. We, and we'll have, as the name of the podcast suggests, we'll have a bit of banter along the way. Bit of Beatles banter. Bit of Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. So there is nothing nothing like a tongue twister to, to get you going. <laughs> but but what, what sort of things can people expect, Dave? What, what, you know, we, we, we've sort of mapped out in very strategic detail what we're going to do. That sounds um, impressive, you know, well, as if we planned this. We've got a piece of paper in front of us, and we thought we'd go from here. We just turned up, met you outside five minutes ago. We thought we'd better do it, hadn't we? But what, 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 have we, what sort of ideas have we got for the, uh, for the, for the podcasts that are coming up? Um, I think it's important that we do the story of the early Beatles. Um, so obviously we'll be looking at the formation of the Quarry Men, some of those important stuff about when they played there at St Peter's when John and Paul first met. But some of the lesser known stories as well. Hopefully get some good guests in. And we also want to explore the Beatles Merseyside because there's probably a lot of people in Liverpool don't realise that there's Beatles connections way out over on the Wirral, up north, up into the Lidland, down in Speak. You know, it isn't just about Matthew Street, the centre of Liverpool or Penny Lane. There's so much more to the Beatles story. Yeah, there is. And, and there's always a, a great story behind the story as well, isn't there, really? There's always a little quirk of detail. And one of the great things I've enjoyed so much about your, your, uh, your writing, Dave, is that you uncover the stories that other people haven't uncovered. And it's it's great to hear that because I think storytelling is so important to history, isn't it, really? It's the way that people remember things in history when they hear a story. And there's nothing, nothing better than having a good story told. And, and I know that you are full of good stories and we'll be going out and about uh, to find these places, to uncover them. And through the podcast and through social media, we'll, we'll let you know more about social media later with, with photographs to show you where, we, where we've been. Uh, we'll be able to, uh, to bring those stories to life. That's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Yeah, and, and also we want to make it a bit interactive because we've got our ideas planned in these many, many strategic meetings, as you were saying. I think, I think we need another <laughs> breakfast, actually. I think we do need another <laughs> breakfast, actually, yeah. But we'd also then want listeners to let us know no, actually, they want to know more about something else, so we can head off and let, let's do that. And let it be not just designed by us as the show that we want to do, but that Beatles fans out there want to find out more about. So, you know, we can say to them, let us know what you're interested in. Let's see if we can uh, make something, not not make something up. Let's see if we can put a programme together. Around. <laughs> we'll need a breakfast with every single idea, obviously. Yes. So, so there we go. But what, what we thought we'd do to start with for our very first Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley 
I thought really what we need to do is to take it right back to the very beginning. And we're actually not talking about the very beginning of the Beatles in, in their young lives in Liverpool in the 1940s. We're going way, way back because you, the way you put it to me, Dave, was about you You said something about Liverpool and the Beatles, didn't you? About that, you know, they couldn't have come from anywhere else. What would just tell, tell our listeners what you said? Well, the thing that I came up with for the cover of Liverpool was to understand the Beatles, you've got to understand Liverpool. They could not have come from any other city, and hopefully that will come through with the various programs that we do. It's a very unique place, but it's what makes Liverpool unique is what made the Beatles unique, that yeah. they could only have come from a city like Liverpool. Yeah. So what we thought we'd do, if you want to understand the Beatles, you've got to understand Liverpool. What I thought we'd do is go out and discover and uncover Liverpool's history, going right back to the very, very beginning, right back over 800 years. When you were a lad. When I were a lad, uh, right back to the very beginning and, and taking people really through a, a bit of a timeline of Liverpool. And that's what we did for our very first podcast. We went out onto the streets and in particular to the place where the story of Liverpool really began. So here we are on a, a cold afternoon in Liverpool, clear blue skies, and we're by Liverpool One. And like a lot of people, they're staring down through some kind of porthole under John Lewis. Why on earth are they doing that? Well, Dave, we're very close to what people often refer to as the Strand uh, in Liverpool. And the reason they call it as the Strand is because this is the original shoreline of the river. The river from where we're standing is about 200 to 250 metres away uh, to, the, uh, to the west of us. Uh, but uh, the river used to come up to the road, which you can probably just hear in the, uh, the background. And the reason we've come here is because we want to look right back to where Liverpool started. And this is where it all started. OK, so we know officially Liverpool became a town back in 1207. So what's so significant about this location? Well, you're absolutely right. 1207 is the date that everybody refers to. There were references to Liverpool going back into the latter part of the 12th century. Around about 1190, there were references there. And uh, where we're standing now, as I said, is a very historical part of the town. And the reason we're here is quite simply because if you can imagine that the river is running right up to the, to the sidewalk, to the pavement where the Hilton Hotel stands today, uh, at that point, there was an inlet and the inlet went up into the town and people often refer to the inlet as the pool and in old english a language that isn't used anymore the word for muddy cloudy was liffer and it was a muddy and cloudy pool a liffer pool and that was where the name of the town came from so the early references to liverpool came from around about 1190 but officially the town came into being on the 28th of august 1207 uh, that was uh, 811 years ago Wow, so where we're actually standing now, uh, we're actually getting our feet wet, we're in the pool. So how far did this pool and this inlet actually go into what is now covered over? It went some significant way into the town, upright, uh, what we call Whitechapel and beyond uh, here. And we have to say that although Liverpool came into being in 1207, granted with a, a charter by King John, it didn't really have much of an effect. It was 500 years before we started to develop as a, as a port, uh, because the main port in the northwest of England uh, had been Chester, uh, which is about 20 miles away, which stands on the River Dee, very slow moving river. And over time, that river silted up and could be used less and less usable and eventually became unusable. And the key date in Liverpool's history after 1207 came 500 years later in 1715, because that was the date when Liverpool opened its very first dock on the banks of the river. And where was that dock? Exactly where we're standing now. So that's what people are looking down at by Liverpool One? That's exactly it. The, uh, when they developed Liverpool One, opened it in 2008. Uh, the Princess Royal opened it in October 2008 officially. Uh, but in the excavations that they'd made in the time leading up to the building of it, they discovered that the walls of the old dock uh, were still there. And so what they've done is to excavate that area. And now through National Museums Liverpool, through the Maritime Museum, you can actually visit the, uh, the old dock, go into the ground, into the excavations of Liverpool One and see where that dock is. But yeah, exactly where we're standing now, this is where the modern day development of Liverpool started because this is where Liverpool started as a port in 1715. So for Liverpool history, it's dominance then as a port. This is what establishes and this is what makes the modern Liverpool that of course the, the Beatles were eventually born into. So what effect did that have for Liverpool? 
Liverpool as a global city? Well, this is really where it all started, absolutely right. We talk about 1207, and that, yeah, is the official start of the town, but uh, Liverpool became an incredibly wealthy port, particularly in the 19th and the early 20th century. And the beginnings of that came in this area where we are now, where we're standing, where the, uh, the old dock was founded, because that dock began over a hundred years of dock building that turned Liverpool into one of the busiest and wealthiest ports anywhere in the world. It would actually be difficult to overstate how wealthy a port Liverpool was. And indeed, in the days of the British Empire, Liverpool was often referred to as being the second city of the empire after London. It was an incredibly wealthy place. So what wealth was coming in, was coming in through uh, the ships, coming in through the port, but what sort of goods uh, were being transported and of course we have to mention the, the slave trade as well. We do have to mention the slave trade. On top of the slave trade, cotton. Liverpool was the preeminent port uh, in the country for cotton. Of course the cotton came in here and then went off to the cotton mills in the Lancashire and around Manchester area in the days of the Industrial Revolution, rum, tobacco. But yeah, we, we have to mention slavery. Uh, slavery played a big part in the economy of Liverpool. Now Liverpool was actually late into the slave trade. London and Bristol, which for those of you who don't know the geography of the United Kingdom is in the southwest of the country. Liverpool and London and Bristol were both heavily involved in slavery before Liverpool was. By the time slavery was abolished in the United Kingdom in 1807, Liverpool ships had taken part in 5,000 slaving journeys. And to put that into context, that was the same number as London and Bristol added together. A huge amount of money was made from slavery. Now slaves very, very rarely came to Liverpool. The way that the system would work, the ships would leave the River Mersey laden with cargoes, sail down to the west coast of Africa, the cargoes were sold or exchanged for slaves and the slaves were then taken across to South America and the Caribbean and the ships would return back into Liverpool laden with different cargoes. It was often referred to as a triangular trade and a huge amount of money was made from slavery to such an extent that when it was abolished some people actually thought that that might be the end of Liverpool as a port. And of course um, for those who um, are listening to this in America that was the reason Liverpool got quite heavily involved in uh, the US Civil War, was because of our support for the Confederate States because of the cotton. That's exactly right. Uh, the merchants of Liverpool, uh, the merchants of Liverpool had a vested interest in the outcome of the war because 60% of all the cotton that was exported from the Confederate States came into Liverpool. So when the war happened, the Union blockaded the Confederate ships and there was what you might call a cotton famine. There was no cotton coming in. And this was day before the days of governments giving benefits to people who weren't in work. If you didn't have work, you didn't earn money, you didn't eat, it was as simple as that. And there were really big problems. And financially, that brought the merchants of Liverpool into the American Civil War. And it has to be said that during the American Civil War, Liverpool was something akin to post-war, post-Second World War, Eastern Europe. It was full of spies for the Union, for the Confederacy. Trent Homes were a Liverpool company. They were the bankers to the Confederacy. And also, in complete secrecy, a, a naval representative of the Confederacy, James Dunwoody Bullock, came to Liverpool and negotiated with the building of a warship on the banks of the river. Now, this ship had to be built in secret because Britain had an act of neutrality at the time. It was not allowed to get involved in foreign wars. How would you build a warship in secrecy? It was actually built as a merchant ship and the British government only discovered hours before the ship set sail what its true purpose was. By the time their officers arrived in Liverpool, the ship had gone. It left the river, it went off to the Azores, it was fitted out as a warship and given the name of the CSS Alabama. The Alabama went on to be the most successful warship in naval history, capturing or sinking more enemy vessels than any other ship. And that ship was built here on the banks of the River Mersey. And the last connection was actually the last part of the Civil War, because the very final surrender of the American Civil War didn't take place in America. It took place here in the River Mersey. The last ship to surrender was the CSS Shenandoah. The captain headed to a port with which he was familiar, Liverpool, and send, surrendered his ship and his men to the mayor of the town. So, obviously, the port is important. One thing, again, often gets said that, that people from Liverpool are called Scousers. And again, this to do with our cosmopolitan mix. Where does the term Scousers come from? Well, if you go to Norway today, you can still buy lob scouse, and they pretty much pronounce it in the same way. And it's thought that uh, the derivation of the word was Norwegian, coming across with the Norwegian sailors. But if you, if you taste scouse and you look at scouse, 
you would probably say the closest relative would be like an Irish stew. So it really would have been full of anything that people had. It was, it was considered quite a cheap meal to make. And uh, today, you might call uh, a dish without any meat in vegetarian. Well, if you didn't have the money to put any meat into your scouse, and it was just vegetables, it was called blind scouse. And, and so it was the derivation was from lob scouse. And as you quite rightly say, Dave, we here are known as scousers. That brings on to another quick thing, which was, we're also called Liverpudlians, and others say Liverpolitans. Now, I believe the Liverpudlians was more uh, something that's come maybe from Manchester somewhere. It wasn't actually meant as a compliment. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. And we were at one time known as Liverpolitans, which quite sounds rather grand, doesn't it? Really? I'm going to call myself one of them. I, I think, think you and I should have a campaign to bring that back <laughs> yes. into use, Liverpolitans, uh, because again, you know, sometimes because of the uh, the way the media have dealt with Liverpool over the years, sometimes you know even Scouser has been used in a in a sort of pejorative sense, really. Uh, but we're very proud of our, of our heritage, and yeah, we're Scousers, we're Liverpudlians, we're Liverpolitans. We are people of Liverpool. Now, talking about uh, Scouse, you mentioned it's quite similar to Irish stew. We've got to talk about the huge Irish influence in Liverpool, and particularly via the potato famine, which, of course, brought the Lennons and the McCartneys over to here. So, what impact? did that potato famine have on the city of Liverpool? Had a, a massive uh, impact in the middle part of the 19th century. Uh, potatoes were the staple crop of Ireland and for several years the crops failed. And there was starvation. There's no other way of putting it. There was starvation across the island. And uh, some people decided that their only future was to leave Ireland. And Liverpool was one of the closest uh, places in England to get to. And by 1847, over 300,000 destitute Irish people had arrived in the town, uh, bringing with them their Irish heritage, their Catholicism, and also their great love of music as well, and the great, the great flamboyant nature that the Irish have. And almost overnight, Liverpool started again to develop as a town, because if you trace the roots of any Liverpudlian, any Scouser, any Liverpolitan, back to the very beginning, very few of us are from here originally. We will be Irish, we'll be Welsh, we'll be Scots, we'll be Chinese, we'll be Scandinavian, we'll be from the Caribbean, we'll be from all over the place, because Liverpool has been, certainly for the last 300 years, very much an immigrant city, and the Irish played a big part in that immigration, shaping the character of Liverpool. And a lot of people would say shaping the accent of Liverpool as well. Absolutely. We, uh, as, the, as the song uh, from the 60s goes, we speak with an accent exceedingly rare. And it, it is, a, within, certainly within the United Kingdom, the Scouse accent is a very recognisable accent. And uh, certainly when visitors from overseas come here, uh, it, it's an accent that they sometimes can understand and sometimes they can't understand as well. But uh, yeah, shaped over time by people like the Irish coming into Liverpool uh, and other dialects as well. So I think it's quite a unique city and sometimes, I don't know if you feel this, but Liverpool looks more across the Atlantic to America than it actually does down south to our own capital in London. Liverpool has never looked inwards towards the rest of the country for its inspiration and it certainly has not looked towards London for its inspiration. Being a port city for 300 years, being a city which has always had a, a pair of open arms to anybody that comes in. It's always been willing to look outwards. And all those nations that Liverpool was trading with, some of which were not even trading with other parts of the country at the time, those were the nations that we were going to. We weren't only exchanging and buying goods there. We were taking on their culture, their, their history, their music, their ambiance, and, and that was what Liverpool was doing. And so we've never, ever looked inwards to the rest of the country for our inspiration. We've always been looking outwards. And for that reason, uh, it, it is a, a, it's a very cosmopolitan city, Liverpool. And uh, one of the phrases that was used in the years leading up to the capital of culture here is that it's, it's the world in one city. And in many respects it is, not just because people from around the world live here, but the way in which we've embraced cultures from around the world. Now, obviously the 20th century has seen some very tough times for the city. Um, Obviously, starting at the time, you know, we're thinking of when the Beatles were getting born, 
you know, in the early 1940s, that was during the Second World War, and Liverpool suffered terribly during the war, didn't it? People often ask me, particularly overseas visitors, about whether Liverpool was bombed during the war. It was second only to London in terms of the amount of bombing. Now, we, we are 200 miles north of London, so that's some distance away, and there's plenty of other cities along the way, and they too were bombed. But uh, it was worth the bombers of the Luftwaffe are making that 200 mile journey and all the risks that that entailed because Liverpool was a major port during the Second World War. What the Germans didn't know is that the Battle of the Atlantic, the longest running battle of the Second World War, was actually planned and operated from a secret basement headquarters here uh, in the city. But what they did know is that lots of troop and supply ships were coming into Liverpool. One and a quarter million American and Canadian servicemen who came to the country during the war set foot in the United Kingdom here in the port of Liverpool. And certainly in the early part of the war, those supply lines were absolutely vital from North America. And for that reason, Liverpool was very, very heavily bombed indeed. The really difficult time for the city came during the May of 1941, when the city suffered seven nights of continuous bombing. Night after night, the German bombers came back. It was very badly bombed during the war. Now the Battle of the Atlantic for some reason isn't as well known and for a lot of people they think well the battles at sea that, that's all the warships but it was the merchant navy that was key to bringing those supplies in particularly from North America wasn't it? That was absolutely vital. The, the role that the merchant navy played was was could not be overstated. It was a huge role because uh, a country can't survive without without food, without goods, without all sorts of things. And the merchant navy, th those brave merchant navy men, kept open those supply lines uh, for for the goods to come into Liverpool and then to be disseminated uh, around the country. A, a huge part in the success of the war. Yeah. So obviously, then post-war, this is the the city that the Beatles were, were growing up in. We didn't recover very quickly. So much of the city was damaged. It took a long time to start rebuilding. And Liverpool never really seemed to have recaptured those days of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And particularly from a shipping and a port point of view, we saw quite a decline, didn't we? We did. There were signs before the war that that decline was starting to happen. You know, certainly some of the the, uh, the liner business that had been founded here in Liverpool was starting to move down to places like Southampton, uh, only because the Liverpool companies took it down there. It wasn't lost business in that sense. But then, yeah, the war devastated large sections of the uh, the city. And as you said, Dave, the, uh, the city didn't recover very, very quickly. The Beatles grew up into this post-war atmosphere. Clearly, they didn't know anything about the war. They were just babies at the time, but they grew up into years of austerity. They grew up into years when rationing was still the case. We still had rationing in the United Kingdom until the uh, until the early 1950s on certain products as well and when you combine this was a city which had been very severely bombed and wasn't recovering in a construction sense very quickly and that was the atmosphere they grew up in but they also grew up into the atmosphere of American rock and roll music and Liverpool was still a major port at this time and lots of connections with the United States of America yeah that's a supply line that had been there during the war suddenly in the, the 1950s were bringing records in now we've had this story of the Cunard Yanks and some of them have blown it into mythical proportions but that was still so important and it sort of made Liverpool quite unique within the UK because we were getting access to, to records to music that maybe other cities weren't getting hold of yeah, we may well cover the story of the Cunard Yanks uh, and the, the, the myth and the fact at, at some stage during our podcast day. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Liverpool sailors were being exposed to the, to the music when they were across there in the United States, on the East Coast especially. They were being exposed to that, that music and they were bringing back with them that influence. Uh, and th this has been true for Liverpool for hundreds of years. You know, as I said before, different styles of culture coming into the city from all over the world has given Liverpool this unique sort of feel and character to it. But that's absolutely right. Post-war years, 1950s, American rock and roll music, Liverpool sailors were hearing this before the rest of the country was. That must have made a big difference into the atmosphere into which the Beatles were growing up as teenagers. Yeah. Now Liverpool, as you and I will know, you know, the city when we were growing up, particularly in the, in the 70s and 80s was a, was a period of decline. Um, a lot of negative media, certainly nationally. But then, as you mentioned before, European capital culture suddenly seen this massive revival in Liverpool. What do you think the impact was 
of being named European Capital of Culture in 2008? I think it was absolutely huge. Uh, Liverpool, as you quite rightly said, had suffered real decline in the 70s. Lots of factories closed. The docks uh, were closing down. Liverpool closed half of its docklands in 1972 with the south docks of the city closing. Uh, and, and obviously mechanisation meant that uh, whilst the weight of cargoes was still great, the number of workers that were working on the docks were few. And then in the early 80s, Liverpool as a city went head to head with national government, with its local council and the national government really politically going head to head with each other. And it was a really dark time for the city. And at the same time, you know, because of the lack of jobs here, people were leaving and Liverpool's population was dwindling almost by the day. Uh, but then, the early 1980s also start to, be, to, to begin to see a renaissance for the city. Um, I guess it, it has to be said, and you know, we'll, we'll touch again on this uh, at another stage, there were two events that took place within the space of about eight or nine months in Liverpool. In December 1980, we all know John Lennon was murdered in New York. Why was that important? Well, it was important for so many reasons. One thing it was certainly important about was it was the first Beatle yeah. to be lost. And then, in the July of 1981, probably only about half a mile away from where we're standing now, the area of Toxteth in the city had riots. They became known as the Toxteth Riots, happening for all sorts of reasons. We haven't really got time to go into all of that now, but happening for all sorts of reasons. And the important thing was what happened after the riots were over, because that was when the renaissance of Liverpool started. Certain people within national government, people like Michael Hasseltine, Lord Hasseltine as he is now, recognised that Liverpool could have uh, a bright future again. But at this stage, it was probably at the lowest point it ever could get to. Uh, but in, the, in the, the wake of, of the riots, it was then that the docklands of Liverpool started to be developed. And over the next couple of years, uh, the whole of the South Docks, which had been redundant for over 10 years, have been, were brought back to life. And today, they are a shining example of business, leisure and tourism. And in 1988, the Albert Dock, which is literally just 100 metres from where we are now, was reopened as a visitor attraction. Of course, Beatles' story is down at the, uh, the Albert Dock and has been for over 25 years now. But that was the beginning. That was only the beginning. Because over the last 35 years, Liverpool has seen that renaissance spread throughout the city. And one of the great highs, as you quite rightly say, Dave, was 2008, the capital of culture year. Now, there were several cities, over a dozen different British cities were vying for that title. The way it works is that one country within the European Union is able to nominate the capital of culture for the whole of Europe uh, for that year. And in 2008, it was the turn of the United Kingdom. Uh, something like 15 different cities at one time wanted that title. Liverpool was just one of those cities. And it was a city which was clearly up there at the, at the start, but everybody, and especially the people in Newcastle, thought that they had won the title. In fact, Newcastle City Council was so confident of winning, they hired a light aircraft to fly around the city with a banner at the back saying congratulations. When the news broke, issued by the British government in 2003, that the winner was to be Liverpool, that light aircraft flew down to Liverpool. I think the pilot was actually paid twice in the one day by two different councils. But yeah, in 2003, the British government announced that in five years' time, Liverpool would be the capital of culture. And again, that was a massive boost. Five billion pound of public and private money came into the city in the years leading up to capital of culture. And although it was not conceived as part of capital of culture, where we're standing now, Liverpool One was open during the capital of culture year. And that was a massive boost for the city. It changed the city structurally, and it gave the people of Liverpool another boost. And Liverpool is a very passionate place. It is a real really, really passionate city where the people are quite rightly proud of the city. And something like Capital of Culture gave us a platform from which we could be as proud as we could ever be. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So that is why today we're not actually getting our feet wet in the, in the famous pool of Liverpool, but we're standing by Liverpool one, but you can still see the old docks. Uh, you, know, you can look at the Albert Dock and millions of people go there. It's a fantastic place to visit. and. It's nice, and I don't know if you agree with this, Paul, but something about Liverpool is we're so proud 
of our heritage and our history here, aren't we? We are. We are absolutely proud, and, and I think quite rightly so. We've got a we've got a tremendous history, a very checkered history in some ways. You know, we said before we got involved in slavery and things like this. We had a difficult time after the war. We went head to head with the national government in in a political sense. So Liverpool is one of those cities which you know sometimes shoots itself in the foot. Most of the time. Uh, it's just a great city, full of great history, full of great buildings, full of people who are very passionate about the place, but also very welcoming to the place as well. And that is the city into which the four Beatles were born and the city into which they grew up. And that is why the Beatles could only have come from Liverpool because of that diversity of its history, its heritage, its music, its culture. It could only have been Liverpool, couldn't it? You're absolutely right. And I think the, the nature of the Beatles, their creativity, their humour, their wit, their passion, it could only have been Liverpool. You're listening to Liddypod, Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. So hopefully now you'll be thinking of us as rather distinguished Liverpoolitans. We're definitely going to bring that back, aren't we? I, we, we? I think we should have a campaign to bring Liverpoolitan back. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, hopefully you've, uh, you've learned... Just a little bit about uh, the history of Liverpool and, and how important it was. And obviously in uh, future episodes, we're going to be covering different aspects of the culture, the history, the influences as we look through the, the story of the Beatles. We've got all sorts of that kind of thing uh, coming up, haven't we, Paul? We have, yeah, because we, we talked earlier about going out to various locations. We are going to do that, but we, we're also going to have interviews with people and we're going to cover themes as well, aren't we, Dave? We're going to look at themes yeah. around the Beatles. So it won't be purely a location-based thing. Uh, but as you said quite rightly earlier on, if people have got ideas and suggestions, then, yeah, please uh, please let us have them and we'll uh, we'll try and incorporate them into a, into a future podcast. Yeah, and of course, if you've got a location in mind, all you have to do is tell us where to go, which, which we're well used <laughs> in, to. In the nicest possible way. <laughs> yes, of uh, course. Of course, yeah. So, Dave, we, we've talked about, you know, people giving us ideas with suggestions, also subscribe, subscribing to the podcast. How, how, how do they do that, Dave? Uh, nice and simply, what we've done is we've uh, set up a domain as www.liddypod.com. Can you spell so, that for us? Yeah, T H A T. Yeah, Liddypod, L I D D Y P O D, liddypod.com. And then from there, you'll be able to subscribe to the podcast so you get episodes every time uh, one goes up there. But then there's links to our social media. So we'll be on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. So if you want to contact us, find out anything more about the program, liddypod.com is uh, the place to go. And rather frighteningly, they'll be able to see what we look like as well, won't they? Well, unless, and we might do this as a fundraiser, uh, to raise money for a, a good charity for us not to show pictures of ourselves on I, there. I, I would I would contribute to that myself, actually. I mean, it has been, has been said by people with, should have a bit more respect, but um, I do have the perfect face for radio. I, I would go along with that, and I would agree with that myself as well. And we, we've both got the perfect face for radio. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's uh, it, it's going to be exciting. This, um, and uh, we've got loads of ideas. I'm sure you guys have got loads of ideas as well. So do get in touch with the subscribers, David said to the to the uh, to the podcast through liddypod.com. And uh, you won't miss an episode then. And also, you'll be able to see the various locations that we're going to go out and visit, and people we're going to talk to as well. So that's about it for now. The first one done and dusted. Yes. It's in the bag. We owe ourselves a breakfast. And we've sort of promised them they're going to get another one, haven't we? So we better do it. We've got to do another one. We've got to do another one. Oh, right. Okay. We've got to do another one. But uh, it's been fun and we hope, we, we hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much and uh, hope you listen next time round. You've been listening to Liddy Pod, Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. Subscribe at liddypod.com and you'll never miss another episode. Mm-hmm.